Dear Professor Lipstadt, dear Commissioner von Schnurbein, distinguished ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On 6.30 a.m. on Saturday morning of, se of October 7th, the morning of Simchat Torah ho holiday, a holiday celebrated by Jews all over the world, 1,112 Israeli citizens, men, women, children, babies, disabled and elderly, were slaughtered by terrorist organization Hamas, as well as by Palestinian civilian collaborators. Babies were shot in their beds, in their pajamas. Children were beheaded in front of their parents. Mothers and fathers were burned alive in front of their children. Ladies and gentlemen, the 7th of October was hell on earth. The massacre of Jews on that bright daylight on Israeli soil on that horrible Saturday, 80 years after the Shoah, shocked Israel, shocked the entire world. This hell continues to this very moment, moment as there are still 135 Israeli hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. They are kept in darkness with no medicaments, food, or idea of time. Due to this massacre and to protect the lives of its citizens, Israel engaged in a war against the terrorist organization Hamas. Since the beginning of the war, it seems that truth and facts are, in many parts of the world, questionable and even denied. Too many people across the globe today are not confused by the facts. To them, it's also met maybe a matter of context. Across the Arab world, and not only there, Jew hatred has risen to horrendous, unprecedented numbers. Anti-Israel demonstrations, riots, calling for the destruction and annihilation of the Jewish state are loudly heard and seen. Demonstrators spread vicious lies, conspiracy theory, theories, and dangerous historical revisions on the streets and on social media. The spillover to those, of those events is also seen in the West, in campuses, in US Congress, on the streets, from Berlin, London, to Paris, and New York, everywhere. After October 7th, there is nowhere safe if you're a Jew, if you're an Israeli. And if you're an Israeli Jewish woman and you were raped, well, women organizations will not support nor believe you. And this in 2023. Our panel today is an invitation to dive for an hour into narratives of Jews in Israel in the Arab world since that horrible Saturday morning that are in the center of discourse. Narratives which are not, not new, but after October 7th have reached the most dangerous point from words into actions. We will analyze their manifestations as well as their spillover in the West and ask how are they affecting Western liberal discourses as well and what can be done to combat them. We will, of course, later on open uh, the discussion here in the venue and allow you, of course, to ask questions and refer. I'd like to um, invite to the stage our distinguished speakers uh, to sit on, in the, in the, on the stage. INSS staff. And of course, Professor Deborah Lipstadt is invited to sit next to them. Our first speaker is Dr. Ophiel Vinto. Ophiel is senior researcher at INSS. He holds a PhD from the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University. He's also the author of two books, Zionism in Arab Discourses, and the recently published Peace in the Name of Allah, Islamic Discourses on Treaties with Israel. The title of his presentation is Al-Azhar's Endorsement of the October 7th Attack. Please, Ophir. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, Professor uh, Liebstadt, uh, Ruti, uh, Adi, uh, ambassadors, it's great to be here. Since the October 7th uh, attack, we have observed various positions in the Arab Muslim uh, world, ranging from supporting the killing of innocent Israeli civilians 
to denouncing terrorism and condemning Hamas. Unfortunately, one of the most alarming responses has come from the Islamic institution of Al-Azhar in Egypt. Uh, I would like to start with a very short background about Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is an Islamic uh, academy founded in Cairo in 1998 and currently operates as one of the world's largest uh, universities with half a million students. Uh, it enjoys global influence in the Islamic uh, Arab Sunni world. In 1961, Al Azhar was nationalized by President of Egypt then, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, you can see him here in this uh, old picture. Its main source of uh, funding of Al Azhar is the government of Egypt. Uh, since Nasser's time, Al Azhar has served as a tool to provide religious legitimacy to the policies of all Egyptian uh, regimes, including in the context of their relations with Israel. And for example, uh, during Nasser's time, Al Azhar decreed that Muslims are forbidden to sign peace treaties with Israel. In contrast, in 1979, as Sadat signed the peace treaty with Israel, as Al Azhar reversed its position and issued a supportive opinion. The relation between Al Azhar and the current Egyptian government is somewhat uh, complicated, I would say. In 2015, President Sisi called in his speech to the Egyptian nation for a, a religious revolution against what he defined as the discourse of radical organizations such as ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood and asked Al Azhar to lead this process. Al Azhar responded, though partially, and began a campaign against radical ideologies. Since then, Al Azhar is being marketed by Egypt to the world as a global beacon of tolerance and moderation. However, there is one terrorist, radical, religious organization, an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood that Al Azhar has never criticized. This is, of course, uh, Hamas. Moreover, Al Azhar's Grand Imam, Ahmed Al Tayeb, is maintaining close contacts with the leaders of Hamas. In 2019, he even hosted them in his offices in Cairo. Four days after the October 7th massacre, Al Tayeb spoke with Ismail Haniya, the head of Hamas political uh, bureau, and his message to Haniya was, and I quote, our hearts are with you. And this brings me uh, to share with you some of the statements sorry, of Al Azhar since the outbreak of the war. I will present here just very few ex representative uh, examples. On the day of the massacre, on October 7th, Al Azhar published a statement in which it saluted the Palestinian resistance. This was only the beginning of an ongoing daily pro-Hamas and anti-Israel campaign that is conducted by Al Azhar. Al Azhar praises to Hamas did not result from lack of information about, what, about the, the atrocities that happened on the October 7th. How do we know that? Al Azhar Fatwa Center issued on October 18th a religious ruling 10 days after the massacre permitting the killing of Israeli civilians. It asserted, and I quote again, that, this Israel, that uh, these Israelis are not worthy at all to be described as, as civilians, but rather they are occupiers of land, violet, violators of rights, and deviants from the path of the prophets. Such rhetoric essentially legitimizes the killing of the Israeli civilian victims on October 7th. However, there is also some good news. Deborah, you said before, Khatin uh, Hama. Uh, this fatwa was removed a few days later, probably following 
an intervention, an intervention of the Egyptian uh, authorities. Additionally, Al Azhar is no stranger to employing an anti Semitic uh, rhetoric. During the war, uh, one of its statements depicted, and I quote, the Zionist enemy as a blood thirsty uh, wolf enjoying eating the meat and drinking the blood of children, women, and innocents. Furthermore, an El Azhar scholar called for boycotting international companies uh, owned by Jews and advised against working with the Jews whom he described as treacherous people. El Azhar campaign includes the denial of uh, the atrocities of the October 7th. You can see on your left, uh, these uh, atrocities are referred as Zionist disinformation proven to be a sheer lie, and this is a quote. The demonization of Israel in El Azhar's newspaper, South El Azhar, uh, the voice of El Azhar, includes caricatures, you can see on your right, that compare Israeli conduct to uh, Nazism. Sot El Azhar, this uh, mouthpiece newspaper, has also a children's section one of the latest issues asked young readers to free Palestine and to draw the map of Palestine from the river to the sea. As you can see here, this map does not include Israel or the, or the agreed upon international legitimate principle of two-state solution. This is a manifestation of actually Islamist, Hamas-like approach that does not recognize the state of Israel and implicitly uh, call for its elimination. Why should uh, we find Al Azhar's discourse so troubling? For several reasons. First, it provides legitimacy and perhaps even inspiration for terrorist acts. Its stance contributed to the hostile sentiment in, in Egypt, resulting in the shooting and killing of three, three uh, uh, Israeli tourists in Alexandria on October 8th. Second, many Muslims from east to the west are being exposed to the messages of El Azhar. Since the beginning of the war in Gaza, El Azhar University has organized special workshops for its 30,000 uh, foreign Muslim students that learn in El Azhar. In addition, beyond its main campus in Cairo, El Azhar has branches also outside Egypt, uh, and its messages uh, resonate in mosques from Europe to Southeast Asia. Third, El Azhar stands as a highly influential Islamic institution, make it difficult for other Islamic bodies in other Arab and non-Arab countries to present a religious position that, uh, uh, against the atrocities of uh, Hamas. What uh, measures, and this uh, will be my concluding remarks, remarks what me me measures could be taken to address El Azhar's pro-Hamas, anti-Israel, and occasionally anti-Semitic anti uh, rhetoric? So re regarding Israel, it might be worthwhile for us in Israel to consider Al Azhar as a challenge in our relations with Egypt. According to our peace treaty, both, both parties are uh, committed, and I quote, to abstain from hostile propaganda against each other. Currently, this commitment is not being upheld, and Al Azhar stands out as a prominent example of this violation. As for Egypt, it is in its own interests to review Al Azhar's radical stance, which may endanger Sisi's regional vision for uh, stability and development. And to think Egypt will, will do well to reestablish Al Azhar uh, and Al Azhar's role as a bridge between religious and nations. Regarding other uh, regional and international actors, Many of them, I believe, share the interest in encouraging El Azhar to restrain El, El Azhar's uh, uh, pro uh, Hamas messages. These actors include, of course, the United States, the EU, whom we heard, 
uh, but also uh, uh, the UN and the Vatican, which maintain, by the way, quite positive relations with Al Azhar, as well as moderate Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, over the years, the United Arab Emirates has transferred millions of dollars to Al Azhar, even though it promotes sentiments against peace and normalization, contradicting the UAE's uh, own regional vision. Finally, the global uh, prestige of Al-Azhar should be questioned. Um, it should be questioned as a religious uh, uh, beacon of uh, religious tolerance, uh, uh, and, and, and I think this is a, a very important message. Al-Azhar cannot position itself as a partner in the battle against terrorism and a participant in the interfaith uh, dialogues while simultaneously endorsing the Hamas massacre of October 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Our next speaker is Ms. Mo Link. Mo is a Neubauer Research Associate at INSS and a PhD candidate in the Department of International Relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her dissertation examines Middle Eastern and North African states within the global investment regime and how domestic characteristics such as religion, culture, and regime type shape their positions within it. She holds a BA and MA with honors from the Hebrew University. Please, Mo. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored uh, to be here uh, today speaking with you. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, some preliminary results of a research uh, project I'm working on uh, titled Shaping Perceptions of Conflict, How Holocaust Narratives uh, Inform Arab Media's Depiction uh, of the Gaza War. And in this research, I explore how uh, uh, Holocaust denial and distortion narratives influence the way uh, Arabic media, both traditional media and social media, uh, address the uh, current Gaza war, and specifically uh, the events of the October 7th uh, massacre, uh, utilizing a mixture of denial, distortion, and justification uh, that echo traditional Holocaust uh, narratives. And I also examine how uh, uh, these events, the Gaza uh, war, has been compared on numerous uh, outlets and social media users uh, to uh, uh, the Holocaust. So first, um, let us uh, spend a few uh, moments to say what is a Holocaust denial uh, and distortion. Uh, so the IRA working definition of a Holocaust denial and distortion is discourse and propaganda that deny the historical reality and the extent of the extermination of the Jews uh, by the Nazis and their accomplices in World War II. And some of the manifestations of uh, uh, this phenomenon include attempting to excuse or downplay the severity and key aspects of the Holocaust, underreporting the number of victims, disputing or denying the intentional nature of the Jewish genocide, denying or questioning the use of known methods of mass destruction uh, during the Holocaust, and lastly and importantly, accusing the Jews of fabricating or inflating uh, the Holocaust for political or financial gain, suggesting that it was the result of a conspiracy plotted by the Jews themselves. And uh, also importantly, uh, we can see that Holocaust denial and distortion is uh, pretty prevalent in the uh, Muslim and Arab world. Uh, these data are unfortunately outdated from 2014. This is ADL data, but we see that it, it paints a very grim picture with over 60% of respondents uh, uh, in uh, the MENA region in the Middle East and North Africa, either believing that the Holocaust is a pure myth or that it ha has been uh, much ex exaggerated vis-a-vis uh, -vis the number of victims or the atrocities uh, perpetrated, with only 22% of respondents uh, believing that the uh, historical accounts are accurate. And among some uh, states, some uh, um, audiences, these figures are even much higher. As we can see, 
uh, respondents from the West Bank and Gaza. 82% uh, of respondents uh, in these uh, places uh, believe that the, uh, the Holocaust is either a myth or uh, greatly exaggerated. And of course, there are uh, these perceptions are subject to change. And as uh, uh, Ambassador Lichstadt uh, said, there have been uh, some positive changes, uh, specifically among countries uh, that have signed the Abraham Accords. And I can talk a, a bit more about that in the Q&A. So um, I want to point out uh, four uh, general narratives that emerge uh, from traditional media and social, uh, social media in Arabic concerning the October 7th massacre involving denial, distortion, and justification. So the first is reducing the perceived scale of the attack, downplaying playing its severity, the number of victims, and the nature of the crimes, also asserting that Israel is responsible for the majority of civilian casualties, refuting the claim that Hamas intended to commit genocide with arguments uh, suggesting that the terror attack was aimed only at military targets, accusing Israel of inflating uh, the details and the numbers of the attack to justify a comprehensive war in Gaza, and lastly, rationalizing and legitimizing uh, the massacre as a natural, uh, quote-unquote, response uh, to Israeli offenses and a legitimate aspect of Palestinian resistance. And I have uh, two examples here. Uh, the first is uh, from Twitter, or X as uh, we should call it, uh, from a, um, an influ a Yemenite influencer with over uh, tw uh, 230K followers saying, uh, uh, and the tweet reads, watch one of the Al-Qassam Brigade's heroes entering the home of, a, of an elderly woman with a defenseless girl beside her. He neither scared her nor displaced or harmed her. He reassured her, affirming, we represent our morals and our faith. We reject the killing of the elderly, children, and the weak. And this was uh, given as proof that the atrocity that Israel uh, says that Hamas perpetrated did not actually uh, take place. And the second example is of an UNRWA school principal posted on Facebook on October 7th, saying that in one way or another, it is a time of restoring rights and redressing the grievances of those who were wronged. A second theme is comparing the Gaza war uh, to the Holocaust with claims that uh, arguing that the true Holocaust is what is occurring in uh, Gaza, asserting that the conflict in Gaza surpasses the horrors of the Holocaust, as well as portraying uh, Israel as a Nazi-like state, equating Zionism with Nazism, and drawing parallels between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Hitler. And this is one of the more mellow uh, graphic examples uh, included um, in this uh, online. And I have here uh, two, uh, two examples. Uh, the first of them is from uh, a Bahraini uh, newspaper, Akhbar al-Khalij, saying that uh, what the Palestinian people have endured for the past 75 years is a Holocaust of their own, surpassing Zionist narratives and legends about the Jewish Holocaust. The Zionist entity has perpetrated crimes beyond anything seen worldwide, rendering the Palestinian Holocaust uh, a thousand times more gruesome. And the second example is again from social media. This time it's an Egyptian uh, influencer. Uh, and the tweet reads, we've heard much about Hitler's Holocaust, yet nothing compares to what we're witnessing, the Gaza Holocaust unfolding live before the entire world. While propaganda has morphed the Nazi Holocaust into an untouchable myth, the world is now witnessing the true massacre. And these are only uh, very limited examples. Unfortunately, uh, there are numerous instances uh, I can uh, I can give you um, more examples in the Q&A. And I think that it uh, affirms, it highlight, highlights the importance of combating uh, uh, Holocaust denial and distortion as part of combating uh, anti-Semitism, because we see that these narrative tools of Holocaust denial, Holocaust distortion, are very much prevalent in the, co in the current conflict and shapes the perception uh, of how this war is perceived in Arabic uh, media, both traditional media and social media. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mo. Our next speaker is Ari Kagasi. Ari Kagasi is an expert in the field of global policy and education. As the COO and head of the global partnership at the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in School Education, Impact SE, he leads the work of a think tank that analyzes cur curricula around the world through UNESCO-defined standards. 
Impact SE's work, work stimulates positive change in school, school textbooks, and its policy recommendations have been used as roadmaps by many governments for introducing systematic reforms in national curricula worldwide. The title of his presentation is Textbooks as Political Predictor, Predictors and Barriers or Blueprints for Radicalization. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Adi, Wuti, distinguished guests, Ambassador Lipstadt. Um, I want to speak to all of you today about 25 years of experience um, looking at textbooks and curricula around uh, the region and how textbooks can be a power for change and a political predictor. Um, so first of all, why textbooks? Why education? Many leaders and organizations throughout history understood the power of education to be either a barrier to radicalization or a blueprint to radicalization. Two prominent examples. The Nazis, one of the first things that they've done when they took power is change and completely rewrite their educational curriculum. Same with ISIS, when they ran into Mosul, one of the first things that they've done in parallel to other things was throw away the current textbooks and rewrite their own narratives. Nelson Mandela's one of his famous, most famous quotes is, education has the power to change societies. And leaders in the region understand this power, and I'm going to show you some examples, uh, both positive and negative, um, how they utilize this power to take the next generation um, of their societies to different directions. I want to start with um, the current situation with the Palestinian education in Gaza, UNRWA schools and Palestinian Authority schools, they all study from the exact same school textbooks in use in Gaza, in the West Bank, and UNRWA schools and in East Jerusalem. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly just to give you a taste of what uh, children are learning every single day uh, for, since the year 2000. Fate of Israeli Jews is extermination. This is a teacher guide, not a textbook, a guide for a teacher to teach Arabic language. The exact quote is, the Zionists are the terrorists of the modern age and their fate is disappearance. So when a child uh, in grade six is told this by his teacher, you can understand the connection. Uh, this is uh, an example created by UNRWA and they describe a terror attack against a civilian bus filled with Jews burning in fire from a, Molotov, from a Molotov cocktail as a barbecue party to teach Arabic reading comprehension in grade nine. Dalal Mugrabi, uh, a renowned Fatah female terrorist who killed 38 Israelis on a civilian bus in 1979, including 13 children, is described as a role model for Palestinian kids, particularly girls, not doctors, not scientists, not peacemakers, terrorists. And she is described, and you can see here an image of, of this poster in the, in the UNRWA school. This is uh, in a grade five Arabic language reading comprehension textbook. This is not a history textbook describing a moment in time. It's to teach reading and writing through glorifying acts of terror against civilians. The 1972 Munich Olympic massacre is justified and openly endorsed. The Israeli Olympians are described as Zionist targets. Um, another exercise created by UNRWA describes jihad as the most important meaning of life. So again, not to succeed, not to raise a family, uh, have a career, jihad is the most important thing. Suicide bombings are glorified, as well as cutting the necks of the enemy. This is grade eight reading comprehension. There's an image here of a Palestinian gunman firing at uh, Israeli soldiers, but within um, the reading comprehension, they're proud of Palestinians wearing explosive bel belts and daggers falling on necks of the enemy in grade eight. Anti-Semitism is also prominent um, in the textbooks, not necessarily in a uh, Zionist perspective, but in an anti-Jewish collective manner. So this is a teacher guide for uh, grade 10 geography and history book where, uh, where teachers are instructed to punish students for not connecting Judaism with murder. So they have anti-Semitic grading instructions for the teacher guide. Anti-Semitic imagery, including the famous 
Zionist arm holding a globe in parallel to a U.S. flag uh, or arm with a U.S. flag on it holding a globe. Um, Zionist Jews control media, media, money, and politics, so classic European anti-Semitism is also prominent in the Palestinian textbooks, again, used in Gaza and Hamas schools, used in UNRWA schools, and used in Palestinian Authority schools. First grade, to read and write the letter Ha, H, um, instead of hat, the words that they use to practice writing this letter is martyr, shahid, or hujum, attack. Violence also inserted into science and math. So instead of counting apples and pears in calculus for fourth grade, calculus is taught by counting martyrs and suicide bombers in the first and second intifada, and students are asked, how many martyrs have died in the first intifada? How many in the second intifada? How many martyrs do you get? This is fourth grade math textbooks. Newton's law of motion, not by an apple falling from a tree, but by a Palestinian youth masked with a slingshot towards IDF soldiers with a question asked, what are the forces that are used from the slingshot to the IDF soldiers to describe mass, tensile strength, and motion? Um, obviously, maps, uh, everybody speaks about the maps, they're also in class, but in the textbooks, the river to the sea cliche is not just a cliche, it's a literal quote in the textbooks describing the entire territory of Palestine as from uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, also in UNRWA schools and in non-UNRWA schools. How does this play out in October 7th? Um, we have here the Bir El Saba Boys School in Rafa, um, Muhammad Yasser Zayed Abu Rizak. This is a video of his interrogation. Uh, he crossed into Israel on October 7th and committed many atrocities. We went into the Facebook page of the school and we have seen in this Facebook page, this is a, a Hamas run school. Uh, the dream of honor is not far away. You either live as a hero or die as a martyr with a play about Palestinian prisoners and gunmen within the school setting. So this is not a, uh, a play outside. This is not a Hamas summer camp. This is not anything like that. It's a, it's a school. Um, Palestinian uh, uh, UNRWA schools celebrate the Hamas 7 atta attack. There's, there's UNRWA schools who celebrated this attack as well as Palestinian schools. There's uh, sec uh, second grade girls who are painting paraglide Hamas paragliders who crossed into Israel. And then also uh, uh, Hamas ministers who used to be UNRWA staffers. This is Jawad Abu Shimale, used to be Hamas's uh, Minister of Economy who uh, was killed on October 10th. Other terrorists who were responsible for uh, murdering Israelis, all UNRWA graduates. Um, I'll end with two minutes on positive changes in the region where countries understood the power of textbooks to do better and to stabilize their societies. Saudi Arabia has recently removed a lot of uh, problematic examples from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Another example saying that Zionists use drugs, women, money, politics, and media to achieve their goals. And even this year, the word Palestine on the map uh, was removed. Israel is still not on the map, but at least the word Palestine stretched from uh, on the entire border is, is, is removed. Uh, Egypt recently with uh, Dr. Winter here, in fact, I see that this research started removing textbooks connecting ancient Islamic uh, battles between Jews and the Prophet to modern day Israel and Zionism. They removed that with ideas of peace and tolerance. Morocco, which Ambassador Lipstadt talked about, inserted Jewish culture and history within their textbooks. You have pictures here of the Sabbath uh, and a Muslim neighbor coming to visit a, a Jewish family, Mimuna, uh, the king w in a synagogue. All these in new textbooks recently printed. And the last example is the UAE, who recently announced they will introduce Holocaust education. Um, they added three months after the normalization treaty with Israel, the information about it in Islamic education to get it, give it a religious justification, including messages about peace. I'll end here, and if anybody wants more examples, we have many examples from all countries in the region moving in different directions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arik. Our last speaker before we open for discussion, Dr. Ehud Rosen, specializes in modern political Islam and the Red-Green Alliance between far-left activists and political Islamists in the West. He's a team member of the INSS Project on Perceptions of Jews and Israel in the Arab Muslim World and their influence on the West. The title of his presentation is The Coming Together of Red and Green Narratives in Western 
countries. Please, Udi. And later on, we're opening it for questions. Okay, good afternoon. Pleasure to be here with you. So anti-Semitism has, has a long history and many forefathers. In our time, it is especially thriving among the radical fringes across the political spectrum. What we've been mainly witnessing in Western countries since October the 7th is the result of over 20 years of tactic red-green alliance between elements in the far left and political and radical Islamists spearheaded by those activists who adhere to the school of thought of the Muslim Brotherhood, which, again, is also the mother movement of Hamas. Both sides have been utilizing the freedoms the democracy allows to advance their message through grassroots, civil society, organizations and networks, some of which also supported by state players. The playgrounds are socio-political and educational and economic strongholds like the world of the academia, trade unions, the world of NGOs, and human rights groups, which are unfortunately not asked too many hard questions as to their own affiliations or of those they choose to, to partner with. Uh, the overseas networks affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood, which despite having a minor actual following, purport to speak for Muslims in Western countries, have also provided another layer of support and promotion to Hamas. And during the years, Hamas operatives who moved to Western countries joined them. A senior Hamas figure once divided the Muslim nation into two cultural trends. The first, the trend of resistance, or Mukawama, which according to him mobilizes the masses and should be transformed into a popular thought. This versus the trend of what he called surrender or submission is Islam, which he said has many open doors and the backing of many Western countries. Such, element in, such elements in the Western far left were essential in the process of mainstreaming and romanticizing the trend, this trend of resistance, this while mainstreaming themselves. The writing of the Palestinian issue by applying the terminology of oppressor and oppressed and of a nonviolent struggle against colonialism by direct action activism and the boycotts movement. They utilize Western identity politics and intersectionality with other opposedly, supposedly oppressed minorities. This way, the both reds and the greens are free to push the call for a global intifada meant eventually to challenge the existing liberal order, and the green side can call, for example, for a peaceful intifada in countries like France against its government policies. Speakers from the green side, whose vision is one of a long term, continue to draw their hope from what they see in the streets of Europe and the States these days. Perhaps the, big, the biggest uh, success of this Red Green Alliance, whose people are now an integral part of Western politics and civil service, is the ability to detach the narrative it pushes from any necessity to provide logical explanations or facts. All that matters now is the narrative of victimhood, which makes you automatically right and thus the other side automatically wrong. We are now, ladies and gentlemen, in a new phase in which a new type of hybrid groups is in formation in Western countries, comprised of activists from, from the younger generation who come from different radical backgrounds, acting together also against the Western establishment itself, as both Ambassador Lipstadt and the Commissioner mentioned. <coughs> Uh, the way liberal democracies respond to this outbreak of hatred and violence is not only crucial for the safety of Israel and the Jewish communities, but also for their own stability. And in any case, those dealing with the political rise of the far-right elements already noted 
that this red-green alliance activism is one of the major factors there. For my presentation, I think it was enough to prepare one slide. You can see one of the biggest demonstrations we took, oh, sorry, which took place in the States. Below you can see the logos of the, of, of the organizers which stray from the affiliates of the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States to affiliates of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, again in the States, and many, many far-left groups. And these are the slogans which were raised during only one of numerous demonstrations taking place uh, in the streets today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Udi. Thank you to all the, the speakers. We are now opening um, our panel for, for Q&A, uh, for your questions. You're all welcome, of course, to refer questions to our speakers, of course, also to Professor Lipstadt. If there are any questions, there's a microphone yeah. here. Any questions? Yes, here. There's a gentleman here. <coughs> We'll collect a few and then we'll let you answer. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much all for being here and thank you, Ambassador, for the work that you've done throughout the years. Um, I have uh, two questions, but... Can the, you the first, introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Manny Dahari. Um, I work for the Embassy of Kosovo here in Jerusalem. And uh, I have two questions. I mean, the first part that I want to ask is, I feel like we kind of like didn't really touch up much on the topic of the expulsion of Jews from Arab countries, which should have been really, I think, should have talked about. Um, and this is as someone who was born and raised in Yemen, and I believe my family was one of the last families to escape Yemen. Um, and I would have wanted to ask the minister, but he's not here, why did it take Israel so long to dedicate a day to commemorate the Jews from Arab countries? And the other question is uh, for the ambassador is, is the Biden administration doing much to combat anti-Semitism in countries that do not have peace with Israel? I'll let Professor Lipstadt first answer. Uh, first of all, on your first point about the expulsion of Jews from Arab lands, I think it's a very important issue and one that has been increased, uh, looking, taking a longer perspective, you look slightly younger than I am. Um, it, it's more on the table now than it's ever been before, but not enough. Um, I'm not sure which countries uh, you're, you're referring to, but the Biden administration, uh, the United States government is universally opposed to anti-Semitism wherever it is. Uh, naturally, with the countries with which we have good relations, uh, we feel we can exert uh, more concern, uh, but uh, it doesn't stop us. Where we see anti-Semitism, we will fight it. Uh, I think one of the things to recognize, I, may, I didn't mention this in my uh, uh, talk, but that anti-Semitism, some people speak about the canary in the coal mine, uh, anti-Semitism should also be seen as the flashing amber light of destabilizing of a society. So where we see it, we are concerned about it. Thank you very much. Further questions? If not, maybe I'll ask a question of my own, Dr. Winter, Ophir. Regarding your, your presentation, to what degree are the authorities in Cairo able to influence Al-Azhar's position in Israel's Hamas war, do you think? Thank you for uh, your question. I would just uh, a short comment uh, to what you uh, mentioned about uh, the Jews of Egypt. Uh, there was, uh, like the minister said, a, a big community of Jews in Egypt. About uh, 80 or 90,000 uh, Jews were living in Egypt. I have to say uh, there are, uh, let's say, contradictory trends on that regard in Egypt during uh, the recent years. We found some positive uh, uh, findings also in uh, Egyptian uh, textbooks in, in, a, in a joint uh, uh, research I make uh, with uh, Impact SE. Uh, there are also many uh, books uh, 
that are being authored about the heritage of the Jews in Egypt. At the same time, uh, maybe you heard on the news recently, Jews of Egypt uh, decided not to celebrate this year. Uh, there are very few, uh, but they decided not to celebrate uh, Hanukkah. Um, even though some of the uh, Egyptian uh, synagogues were being uh, renovated uh, during the, la the, the recent years, and th there is still uh, separation in Egypt between, let's say, uh, openness to Judaism to uh, the relations with the Jewish state. So these are two different uh, issues. Uh, uh, regarding your question, Adi, uh, I assume the Egyptian regime has uh, influence on El Azhar, it finances El Azhar, uh, and uh, it has, uh, uh, I think, the ability to uh, improve the messages that are coming out from El Azhar. Yet we should ask ourselves what the Egyptian regime could gain from El Azhar current uh, mil militant line. So uh, I think uh, this is a good question. And I think that this, li this line uh, also serves, uh, unfortunately, some of the official stances in Egypt in terms of, uh, you know, uh, divert the public opinion from internal issues to Israel, which is the external uh, enemy. I think there is also a, a kind of a co-optation of the protest against Israel by the regime. They prefer that the uh, protests will be against uh, or through uh, the religious establishment, official establishment of Al-Azhar, then it will be uh, dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood and could be also transformed into a protest, a protest not, also, not only against Israel, but also against the Egyptian authorities. Thank you. Any further questions, references from your side? We, we discussed a lot, of course, the challenges and the... We saw it in all of your presentations, of course, what has been going on we know it's not new. It, it happened, also, of course, before October 7th, but has definitely increased since then. Arik, we saw the chat, what you presented, depressing information about what you, uh, in Impact SC, have found in textbooks. What are your recommendations to combat that? Uh, on the day after, you know, everybody's talking about the day after uh, the Israel-Hamas war. What do you expect to see, or what would you like to see in uh, textbooks in the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and the West Bank after, after the war? Thank you for the question. Um, the solution to Gaza, nobody has one, but in the realm of education, it's actually, I'll surprise you, very, very, very simple. What happened af uh, up to October 7th cannot continue in terms of this education, and we're working now on a very practical, simple solution that any government can advocate which is basically taking the same Palestinian Authority textbooks, not every single page has incitement to hatred or violence, but there are a lot of it there, and you can replace it with Islamic values, Arab values, culture, um, like other countries in the region have done, by Palestinians themselves who should write this material and replace the hate with peace and tolerance and reprint the exact same textbooks with the same logo by the Ministry of Education, and basically take out the hate. It's not expensive, it's easy to do. There are case studies in the region where there are refugee curricula, where international community and NGOs have created depoliticized content that has nothing to do with, the, with, with violence. There is reality on the ground, and we assess textbooks based on UNESCO standards. And obviously, you know, they can speak about realities of the occupation, uh, hardships that happen, but as long as it does not pass this, you know, threshold or, or red line of not meeting UNESCO standards and pushing children towards violence at a very young age, as we've seen in these examples. And this is, you know, we've been told when we've saw this, well, this is seen, might be seen as uh, colonialism, where you're trying to insert, not impact SC is, is saying how Palestinians should teach or, or the international community, but this should come from Palestinians themselves, and there are Palestinians out there who are working with to use the exact same textbooks, but replace the problematic chapter with a surah or a hadith from the Quran that speaks about tolerance and peace. Islam is a religion of peace. Other countries have used texts based on Islamic and Arab culture 
to create a stable society for their futures. The same thing can be done tomorrow and a new curriculum that we're working on now uh, with Palestinians just to infuse those values based on Palestinian narrative of events and Islamic identity and culture based on peace and tolerance, I think is something also parents would want for their own Palestinian children. So on October 7th won't happen again because Hamas is, is, uh, is an, it's, it's, it's an ideology. And if you remove Hamas today and you don't deal with the education, you will get another version of it in 15 or 20 years. Thank you very much. Mo, well, you, um, you, now we are diving more and more into the narratives themselves. And can you more elaborate on how exactly are Holocaust distortions used after October 7th in Gaza? What, what, what are the narratives that are, that are told with regards the distortions, the lies that are told with regards to the Holocaust. Uh, thank you, Adi. Uh, so I think that the narrative tools that are most, uh, I think that the narrative tools that are most uh, prominent in this discourse is uh, a mixture of distorting and denying the actual historical facts uh, of the um, October 7th massacre. Uh, as I said, uh, reducing the number of uh, uh, victims, uh, arguing that some of the crimes that we know that happened because they were uh, filmed and they were documented uh, did not happen, whether executions, are, uh, sexual violence, uh, and, so, and so on. And just another uh, comment regarding... Uh, Okay, uh, I understand. Uh, I think that the, you can see a lot of terms uh, from the uh, Holocaust denial uh, lexicon, so to speak, uh, being used in, um, in talking about the Gaza war, in talking about the October 7th uh, massacre, uh, such as uh, equating Israel to, uh, to be a Nazi state, equating Zionism uh, with uh, Nazism, equating uh, the Israeli army, Israeli uh, IDF soldiers uh, with Nazi uh, soldiers. Uh, you, you see it also, uh, you see it on social media and you also see it on traditional media and uh, also in outlets uh, that, um, that are aligned with the regimes uh, that uh, Israel has relations with, uh, whether uh, peace uh, treaties like uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan or normalization, uh, um, normalization treaties, uh, Morocco, the Emirates, and Bahrain. Um, and one last comment uh, regarding uh, the commemor commemorating uh, Arab, um, Jewish Arab communities, Jewish communities uh, in the Arab world. So that's another theme uh, I've encountered uh, when conducting this research that uh, a lot of social media users are saying to uh, Israelis, uh, to Israeli Jews, go back to where you came from, and that's uh, supposed to be only Western Europe or Eastern Europe, Poland uh, in particular, uh, completely disregarding, again, the historical fact uh, that many uh, Israeli Jews have roots uh, in, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, countries in the region, uh, from Morocco in the west to uh, Iran uh, in the east. And um, again, it shows a, a distortion of the his, um, historical, historical reality and uh, making it so much harder uh, to go um, towards a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Israeli-Arab conflict uh, more broadly. Very alarming. Udi, you discussed in, in your presentation this hybrid of uh, groups, Red-Green Alliance. Do you see a wider um, meaning to what, what we've witnessed? I mean, this of course has existed of course before October 7th, but is there a new kind of um, um, quality or meaning to what we've seen afterwards with regard to this hybrid, this new generation of hybrid groups? Thank you. Um, let me simply go back to the last part of my words. I think, again, I mean, we have to understand first, uh, uh, the issue is, first of all, understanding. Understanding that Hamas is part of something much wider. It is part, an integral part of the wider political Islamist Sunni world. This ideology has been given a voice all over the Western world for a long time. And uh, what we start to see now with, uh, with these hybrid groups is actually the younger generation 
who no longer feel, feels compelled for facts. They simply leave off the, uh, these narratives. And eventually they come to, as again, I mean, as both Ambassador Lipstadt and the Commission mentioned, eventually they come to challenge the actual establishment in Western countries. This is the basis for what they do now. Uh, we have seen several examples in the past few months. There was a lady, a graduate of a law school in one of the universities in America who uh, spoke in very anti-Israel and, 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 and anti-Semitic uh, language. However, she also spoke against the police. She saw the, the American police as her enemy. And this is the basis of what, yeah, exactly. And we see now uh, over TikTok, young Americans start to adore Osama bin Laden to justify the 9-11 attacks. This is all coming from these narratives who have been around for far too long and went unchallenged. Um, well, I, th I think what we've heard is an exceptionally disturbing set of developments with some uh, positive news there. Um, but I think it shows the degree to which uh, anti-Semitism has become intertwined with a geopolitical crisis. Um, and that doesn't mean that every criticism of Israel is necessarily anti-Semitic. If so, the hundreds of thousands of protesters we saw on the street up until October 7th would be anti-Semites. It's certainly not that. But often, not always, but often uh, this criticism policy either consciously or unconsciously morphs into anti-Semitism. So I think that needs to be addressed and to come back to where I started with, we have to keep in mind anti-Semitism as a threat to international security, international stability, and democracy. Thank you very much. To uh, conclude this panel, I'm, uh, I'd like to ask Michal Kotler-Wunsch, Israel's Special Envoy for Combating Anti-Semitism, to come to the podium. Thank you.